Now, last week we were, I introduced, uh, or we, we focused a little bit about some of the miracles that uh, manifested through Jesus Christ. And it uh, had a very significant impact upon the people that uh, of his age. And it was one of the uh, one of the things that he was noted for, and of course, very naturally, when you have somebody who performs miracles, it attracts a crowd. But I made the point last week that primarily the miracles that he did, they were somewhat, uh, you might say, they weren't aimed at the crowd. What they were aimed at is really his disciples. In other words, to strengthen the belief and the faith in his disciples that he had brought a message and it was through them that this message was going to spread. The most people came and it says in the Bible that many came, but event, eventually there was many of like most spiritual teachers, teachings, people come, people go, but there are those who are deeply touched and you might say are the, the close ones. And it was through them and Jesus' disciples, those that were close, those that are mentioned in the Bible. And of course, there must have been many, many more those who ultimately took those teachings out and eventually had the great impact that Christianity has had historically. And so he came as an avatar with a particular message. And that message was, of course, was a worldwide message. Now, it was a significant message. And so he had to strengthen those, those core disciples. And so oftentimes when these are recorded, of course, passed down through the gospels and the writings of his disciples and the disciples of disciples, that are passed down through the ages. Now, many people over the years, they say, well, these things are just fables. I doubt that because that of the, you, you judge a tree by its fruits, as it said, and you could see that the impact that this, this had on his disciples, who eventually all basically became martyrs, dying for the cause of professing what they had experienced in their life. And so I want to relate Today, I want, I'll just very quickly mention a couple, one or two, but I want to focus on the story of Lazarus, Lazarus. And because it was, there was the miracle of resurrecting Lazarus, who had died from the dead, that had a tremendous impact on the events that would follow and ultimately lead to uh, Jesus' uh, arrest and his ultimate crucifixion. But uh, just to mention a couple other uh other little miracles that that you get you one of them was uh, is jesus uh, uh uh basically there was a great storm and and uh in the midst of the storm the, the disciples were in a boat on the sea of galilee and they were greatly frightened by the storm because it was quite furious the waves were high and they called out you know to uh to Jesus to help them to save them and and basically Jesus appears but of course he appears walking on the water on the on the on the surface of the lake or the sea and it's an amazing experience and so they they see that and Jesus and Peter one of his his primary one of his primary disciples calls out to him you know to uh to let him also come to him walking on the water. And so Jesus motions to him, says, come. And so Peter walks it's out of the boat and he walks over to, to Jesus on the water. He says, but he was greatly af afraid and he was holding on to, uh, to Jesus' hand. And he was greatly afraid of the situation because the waves were high, the storm was large. And that phrase that sometimes we say to people, even is passed down from that time, oh, ye of little faith. <laughs> and that is that comes from that story where you know, Jesus says, oh, you of little faith, you know, do you don't don't you believe? And of course, uh, he says, yes, I believe in, in uh, the winds of ultimately go down. And both Jesus and Peter walk back to the boat. But it, that story, of course, has been transmitted and, and told throughout the ages. But there was kind of an interesting, uh, uh, years later, you know, the great Saint Haridas, I may have mentioned this previously, but the great Haridas, a uh, miracle worker in India a couple hundred years ago, uh, was confronted by a missionary that was, a missionary was preaching to him and, 
And he said, well, what miracles did Jesus do that uh, that was uh, so miraculous and so unique that to him? Because the Christian missionary was saying Christ was unique in that way. He could do miracles. And he said, and the missionary said, well, he could walk on water. And, it was just, and Hari Das said, well, that's not so hard. I can do that too. And he got up and the story goes that he, he was in a, uh, on a body of water there and he walked across the water and back too. And to show that this is not something unique to one individual and historically, this is a, you could say it's a yogic power, the ability to uh, suspend oneself like that or to levitate. These sorts of things are possible, but Jesus in that story demonstrates that it's a universal uh, experience if one has the ability. But the interesting thing, he was able to transmit that also to his disciple and the disciple could also manifest that. So I thought it was kind of an, it was sort of an interesting story. But in, in Jesus' time, what he was known for particularly was for healing, healing others, healing, uh, particularly uh, healing the lepers. It's that a traditional thing in those days. Of course, leprosy was seemed to be much more prevalent than it is these days. And people, of course, shunned the lepers and, and they were outcast, you might say, out of pretty much most every society because people were afraid. Of course, nobody knew where that disease came from and they were afraid of getting it. So they shunned the lepers and the lepers uh, suffered uh, multiple ways, but from that and from the disease. And so like many saints throughout the ages, you know, St. Francis is an example that comes to mind. He affected healing on those. And he basically, uh, the one story is he heals the lepers. Uh, it, it happens in more than one story. And he tells them to go to the local temple and go to the priest and to ask the priest to diagnose him and to give the proper gift to the temple after he is, after they've been healed. And of course, the lepers follow his advice. They go to the temple and sure enough, they are healed. There's one story where he heals 10 lepers. He tells 10 lepers, there was a group of them suffering from leprosy. And he's, he told, tells all 10, go to the temple, go to the local, go to the priest, confess your sins, or then, and, and, uh, and ask the priest to diagnose you and, and help you. And they do. And on the way, they're supposedly, they're all healed. But, all, but one of them comes back after being healed, going to the priest and comes back, follows Jesus' instructions. And, and Jesus is somewhat amazed because where are the others? You're the only one of the 10 who came back and actually came back to the source of where the healing, you know, through Jesus was healed. And he said, and of all the 10, you were, the, you were one, you, he was a Samaritan and you, the foreigner, are the only one who came back to give thanks, you might say. Where did the others go? And in this way, Christ would often admonish the Jewish people. He says, you know, because if supposedly those others were healed also, I believe they were healed on the way, but they didn't even come back. And to, you might say, give thanks or to follow. And you could see that this is one of the things about miracles don't always necessarily change people. A miracle happens, but it, does it really change people's hearts? And so this is, you know, one of the, uh, it just changes outer circumstances, but unless it really changes a person's heart, what good is it in a spiritual sense? Now, obviously it has benefits in other ways, but, uh, but one out of the 10, of course, was touched and Jesus commented upon that. But particularly the story, as I say, I wanted to talk about today is the story of Lazarus and Lazarus. And I'd like to read the section in the Bible and then comment as we go, as I read it, uh, making some points here. And the reason I mentioned this particular story is one, it's extremely famous. It's passed down, raising Lazarus arose from the dead. And uh, it had a big impact because this took place only a, f uh, a few kilometers outside of the city of Jerusalem. And so naturally, the, the city of Jerusalem was where the, you know, the holy city, where the uh, government was, was established and where the head priests were, and it was where people came for Passover. So it was the spiritual center of the Jewish nation. And so 
the head priests and the and uh, those that had in the hierarchy were you know based there and so his miracle of raising Lazarus, Lazarus from the dead had a tremendous impact upon the uh, the people at large, but also particularly because it was right there in the center. Whereas many of these other miracles, they were happening far away. And it was by hearsay, they came and people heard about them in the center of power at that time. And were they believable or not believable, but it had less of an impact and people were reporting these things to the head priests. But here, this one, this one took place right there in the neighborhood, not too far. So let me read this. He says, now a certain man was sick named Lazarus of Bethany, the town of Mary and her sister Martha. Now, if you know the story of the Bible, Martha and Mary were sisters who there's these, uh, there's the various stories that concern them. And they were, they were sisters and they were disciples and their brother, was Lazarus. Therefore, his sister sent unto him, to the Christ in this case, sent unto him, saying, Lord, behold, he whom you lovest, you love is sick. When Jesus heard that, see, they sent a message to him. He said to his disciples, he said, this sickness is not unto death. It's not going to cause death, but it is for the glory of God that the Son of God might be glorified. Now, Jesus loved Martha and her sister and Lazarus. When he had heard, therefore, that he was sick, he abode, or he lived, he, he resided two days still in the place where he was. In other words, he didn't get up and go to attend Lazarus right away. He got this message, probably he was not too far away, but he didn't immediately up and go. Instead, he stayed where he was. And what Jesus is saying here, he says that the sickness of Lazarus is for a divine purpose. It will be an occasion to allow him to manifest his divine power and to be able to demonstrate that divine power. So you could sort of say it's God's will uh, for him to be able to manifest that for his disciples. Then, coming back to the Bible, then after that, after it was two days, uh, said he to his disciples, let us go into Judea again. This is where uh, Lazarus uh, was living. And his disciples say unto him, Master, the Jews of late sought to stone you. And if you go there, so go there again. And Jesus answered, are, not, are, are there not 12 hours in the day? If any man walk in the day, he stumbleth not, because he sees the light of this world. But if a man walk in the night, he stumbles, because there is no light in him. Now, what this is, of course, what he's saying here, he says, one who walks in the day doesn't stumble. In other words, one who walks in the light of wisdom, one who is awake in higher consciousness, he he doesn't stumble in life. He does what is the right thing to do. In other words, his, as I've been saying in another context in classes lately, what he wants, God wants. And what God wants, he wants. So there's no possibility for him to walk in air or to do something in air. So he, he says, so am I making, you think I'm making a mistake, but I'm one with that higher consciousness of God. So I can't make them. It's not a wrong thing to do. It's not. A, and so the disciples, you see, were questioning him. And so he, he who walks into the day does not stumble. He who walks in the light. And he who walks at night or in darkness always is making mistakes. He stumbles. And if one walks in the light of wisdom, he sees uh, that the light, uh, that guiding light of God's hand. And there's no possibility for error. Or a soul walking it in darkness, which, which is the darkness of ignorance, stumbles and commits blunders and activities. In other words, he creates karma. He beholds no guiding light within himself. And so uh, when Jesus speaks, you could also say in this context, when Jesus speaks of the light of the world, I am the light of the world, 
He's not saying I am, in other words, I, Jesus of Nazareth, the man. He's saying I in the sense of the cosmic Christ consciousness that hires. And so when he says, I am the light of the world, he's signifying, I am that cosmic energy, that Christ consciousness, I am the light of wisdom. And that consciousness is the light of God. And so, and again, back to the Bible, these things said he, and after that, he saith to them, our friend Lazarus sleeps, but I go that I may awake him out of the sleep. And his disciples then said, Lord, if he sleeps, he will, it'll do him well. How is it that then, but then Jesus, of course, was speaking in this case, not of, some, of earthly sleep, he was sleeping of the death. And he mentioned that, that, he, uh, that Jesus or that Lazarus had died. And the disciples said, how is it that Jesus speaks of his death? Because they, of course, they thought they just heard that he was sick. Did Jesus know something more than them? He says, but they thought that he had spoken of taking the rest and sleep, as the Bible says. So they didn't know, but Jesus knew that Lazarus had actually died. And so, and, but he, and he hinted to this, but his, his uh, disciples were not aware enough to be able to perceive that. Then again, back to the story. Then said Jesus on to them plainly, Lazarus is dead. And I am glad for your sakes that I was not there. To the, uh, to the intent you may believe, nevertheless, let us go unto him. And then, he, so anyway, they, Jesus is making it clear again that this is an opportunity for him to manifest God's power. And again, for the strengthening of the faith in God. And, uh, uh, and so, they, so this is this is that opportunity, and it reminds me, and maybe also it reminded me a little bit about how Master uh, said in his life, Divine Mother never seemed to, uh, always seemed to arrange circumstances so that he was never absent when someone close to him died, and of course. Lazarus was one of his disciples, you see, and, and was very close to him. Martha and Mary and Lazarus, all brothers and sisters, were very dear to him. So, but, it, but I think the larger purpose here was that he was, it gave him an opportunity to demonstrate something. Then again, then when Jesus came, he found that he, that he had lain in Lazarus in the grave for four days already. Now Bethany, that's the city where they lived, or the village, was nigh unto Jerusalem, about 15 furlongs off. And 15 furlongs is about two miles, let's say about three kilometers. And many of the Jews came to Martha and Mary to comfort them concerning their brother. Then Martha, as soon as she heard that Jesus was coming, went and met him. But Mary still sat in the house. Then said Martha unto Jesus, Lord, if you had been here, my brother would not have died. But I know that even now, whatsoever you will ask of God, God will give it to you. Jesus said to her, thy brother shall rise again. Martha said unto him, I know that he shall rise again in the resurrection of the last day. So, she goes to Jesus, asks him, you know, why didn't why weren't you here? Maybe she's in that sort of tone. He wouldn't have died if you'd have been here because you could have healed him. And uh, Jesus says, don't worry, he'll rise again. But of course, she thought of it in terms of rising because in the Christian tradition, there's a resurrection at the last day. Many believe that there'll be in the end of this world, there'll be when this world ends, all souls will be resurrected on that last day. And all good souls, bad souls will depart the earth and enter into the astral world, you could say, on that last day. It's, it's, it's a belief. But it really, resurrection is, uh, in the literal, more literal sense, is a trans. It's a transition of a soul from one body to another. Uh, and just as uh, Elias was born, as I said, John the Baptist. So one soul moves, it dies, goes into the outer world, then is resurrected again. The soul doesn't die. It continually is resurrected again and again until it overcomes all karma. So, but 
uh, Mary didn't understand it that way. I mean, but he was, Christ was saying literally that he was going to resurrect Lazarus uh, right in his present body. So then uh, Jesus said unto her, I am the resurrection and the life. He, this is a very famous quote in the Bible, I am the resurrection and the life. He that believeth in me, were, were, though he were dead, yet shall he live. And whoever lives and believes in me shall never die. Do you, and he says to, uh, to Martha and Mary, believeth thou this? And she said unto him, Yes, Lord, I believe that thou art the Christ, the Son of God which should come into the world. And so here in the above, uh, what Master uh, writes in his, his writings, he says, in the above words uh, of Jesus, it must be understood that he means by I am, whenever Jesus speaks of I am, he speaks of his soul being one with Christ consciousness. And when he says, I am the resurrection, he means I am Christ consciousness in which all souls rise from a lower state of consciousness to a higher state of inner awakening, inner development. And so his, his words, he that believeth in me, refers not to those who believe in Jesus live physically and in that Jesus Christ, but to those devotees who have practically convinced themselves of their conscious, through their own experience of their consciousness, of the expansion of their consciousness to Christ consciousness existing in everything. And again, Master writes, whoever lives in me and believes, believeth in me, quoting Christ, in me refers to anyone who permanently communes with Christ consciousness within himself and hence believes or is convinced of the immortal Christ consciousness equally present in him and his his uh and christ and of course shall never die means both in the spiritual and perhaps even in a physical sense and uh, to, to one who is in perfect attunement you could say babaji of course is an example of somebody who retains his body and of course one is master of that when one attains such a high state and again Martha, being an advanced disciple, understood what he meant. And she said, he, and he said, I am the resurrection, when he said, I am the resurrection and the life. And, and she says, yes, Lord, I believe that thou art the Christ, the Son manifest in this body named Jesus. And so she basically had that understanding, but most people, of course, didn't. And of course, it, it took a great deal of wisdom, of course, for a disciple to be able to perceive that directly. And, it, and I think his doing these miracles had that impact upon them to make them realize that what he said on a deeper level was the truth. Now, again, back to the Bible. And when she had so said, she went her way and called Mary, her sister, saying, the master has come and he calls for you. As soon as she heard that, she arose quickly and came to him. Now Jesus was not yet come into the town, but was in that place where Martha had met him. The Jews then, which were with her in the house and, com and kind of were comforting her, when they saw Mary, that she was, uh, she rose up, uh, when they saw Mary, that she rose up and in hastily went out, they followed her, saying, She goeth on to the grave to weep there. Then when Mary came to, on to Jesus, where Jesus was and saw him, she fell down at his feet to him. Lord, if thou had been here, my brother had not died. Again, she repeats what Martha had said, you know, that you could see there was a bit of, there was anguish there. She was weeping. And then there's a touching phrase. Then he says, when we, when Jesus therefore saw her weeping and the Jews also weeping, which came on her, he groaned is the word that's used in the old, in the King James Version. He groaned in the spirit and was troubled. In other words, he, he began to weep also out of his compassion for the pain and suffering of his disciples and said, where have ye laid him? Then can and uh, as she, uh, Jesus was asking them said, could not this man which opened the eyes of the blind have caused 
that even this man should not have died. And they, you know, you could see that the, the Jewish who had come out of Jerusalem to comfort Martha and Mary, they were now meeting, you know, Christ for the for Jesus for the first time. And they had heard these stories and they were wondering, could he have actually prevented him from dying as, as his disciples seemed to be saying? And here he is crying at, at the, and weeping with his disciples for the passing of Lazarus. And, and so, but, and so Jesus is asked, he says, where have you lain him? And therefore, he says here again, Jesus, therefore, again, weeping in himself, uh, cometh to the grave. It was a cave and a stone had been laid upon it. And Jesus said, take away the stone, Martha, the sister of him that was dead, said back to him, Lord, by this time he stinketh. In other words, he's, you know, he's, it, he says, for he has been dead for four days. Now, somebody who's died for four days, uh, and it's probably a warm climate there too, they begin to decay and it's a bit, very bad smell. And Jesus said unto her, I said not, said I not unto thee that if thou wouldest believe, thou should see the glory of God. In other words, not that God, uh, he was seen, uh, not in seeking glory or recognition himself, but the disciples would be privileged to see this miracle manifested by God through him. Then the Bible goes on. Then they took away the stone from the place, from the place where the dead was laid. And Jesus lifted up his eyes and said, Father, I thank thee that thou hast heard me, and I knew that thou, thou hast hearest me always. But because of the people which stand by, I said that they may believe that thou hast sent me. So again, here Jesus thanks God, demonstrating that God and is our Heavenly Father and answers our prayers of those who love him and are one with him. In other words, he's not far away. Again, the Bible goes on. And when he thus had spoken, he cried with a loud voice, Lazarus, come forth. And he that was dead came forth, bound hand and foot with grave clothes, and his face was bound about with a napkin. Jesus said unto them, Loose him and let him go. So he is comm commanding the other disciples to go and take those uh, shrouds, death shrouds away from him. And uh, Lazarus, who had been died, he had risen up and he came out. Then many of the Jews which came to Mary and had seen the things which Jesus did believed on him. But some of them went their ways to the Pharisees and told them what things Jesus had done. And that's the end of that story in the Bible. But that point is here. They began, many, many who saw what he did believed him. But others, they saw what had happened, but they went to the Pharisees, in other words, the high priests in Jerusalem, which was not far away, and told them what things had happened. Now, this story, miraculous as it's been passed down to us, had a significant consequence uh, historically. Because it, uh, if, you go, if you read further in the Bible, it says, uh, what happened after these uh, reports of Jesus working miracles, it had a tremendous impact upon the crowds and the people. They saw this and it said that, and even later in the Bible, that he came back later to visit Martha, Mary and Lazarus and that crowds gathered because Lazarus apparently had become something of a celebrity because people were marveled and it had come to him again and again to see the evidence of his resurrection. And so great crowds began to follow him after that because here definitely was a miracle worker and they began to think this is the, this is the Messiah that had been predicted in the ancient scriptures that had come again. Now, many of them interpret that, of course, in an outward way, come again to reestablish the kingdom of the Jews. And they thought of it, of course, in the outward sense. And uh, again, a little bit later in the Bible goes on and says, then gathered the chief priests and, and the Pharisees a council. And they said, what do we? 
for this man does many miracles. If we let him alone, all men will believe on him, and the Romans shall come and take away both our place and our nation. Well, they were the Pharisees who were the, you know, the high priests. They were worried. They saw that, what are we going to do about this? People are beginning to believe in him in flocks and droves. And if we let this go on, more and more people are going to become and going to flock to him and begin to believe in him. And they said that the Romans will come and take away our place in our nation. In other words, the fear was because that the Romans, uh, not that they would, they would, I don't think it was because the Romans would object to their believing, but the beliefs would cause riots would cause disturbance because over the centuries and over the not even much before the time of Jesus, there had been other prophets who had come and they had stirred up such energy and such uh, division against the Pharisees, against the establishment, new ways. It had stirred up so much division that riots had broken out in Jerusalem. And because the Romans, they were not necessarily against the beliefs that the Jews had, they just wanted peace and quiet. In other words, if just keep calm, everything's, they wanted, basically they were in charge, they wanted order, they didn't want disturbance. And if riots would begin to take place in divisions within the Jewish nation, the people would, in from the riots, they would begin to direct their anger toward the Roman occupiers and it would end up becoming a revolutionary war would break out perhaps. And so the Romans primary interest was to keep peace and order. And the Pharisees realized that here we are again, that the Romans will become oppressive. And one of the things the Romans would do is would they would suppress the religion, they would close the temples. And so the Pharisees had that in mind. One, you might say for the greater good, but probably also they themselves would be suppressed. They themselves, their livelihood would be perhaps extinguished. And their chief goal was to just keep everything in the order, keep the status quo, don't rock the boat, you might say. And so this was their, their, their fear. And so they gathered together to say, well, what are we going to do about this? And then again, the Bible goes on to say, say and one of them uh, uh, named Caiaphas, being the high priest, said unto them, You know nothing at all, nor consider that it is expedient, or, or do you consider what is expedient for us, that one man should die for the people, and that the, that the whole nation should perish not. In other words, he's suggesting that basically Jesus should die in his sacrifice would basically save the whole nation from being suppressed by the Romans. And so is that, isn't that the right thing to do? One should die so that everybody is saved. And it goes on, and this sp spoke he not of himself, but being high priest that year, he prophesied that Jesus, Jesus should die for that nation. And not for that nation only, but that also he should gather together in one, the children of God that were scattered abroad. Then from that day forth, the Pharisees and the priests took counsel together for to put him to death. In other words, this is a prophecy that Caiaphas is said to have made that he would die for his, for the sake of, Jesus would must die for the sake of his nation. And he prophesies that Jesus ultimately would gather together the, his flock, you could say, and his, you know, and some people interpret, a, interpret that to mean that his, uh, the ultimate events that took place in the centuries after uh, he was prophesizing that. Of course, it's not exactly known what his, his uh, meaning was, but uh, those are the words that have been passed down through the Gospel of John. And then it says in the Bible, Jesus therefore walked no more openly among the Jews, but went, went thence onto the country near to the wilderness, into a city called Ephraim, and there continued with his disciples. And the Jews' Passover was, not, was close at hand, 
And many went out of the country up to Jerusalem before the Passover to purify themselves. Then sought they for Jesus and spake and, and said amongst themselves as they stood in the temple, What do you think? Will he what that he will not come to the feast? Now, in other words, it was a little bit before Passover, which was when Jews would come from all over the country to worship there in Jerusalem. And they began to ask, I wonder if Jesus is going to come. And an anticipation amongst the people of, of Jerusalem and of the all the people that were coming was in the air. Is he going to come or is he not come? Now, both the chief priests and the Pharisees had given a commandment that if any man knew where Jesus was, he should show him that they might take him. In other words, the scenario is being set for the imprisonment and ultimately the crucifixion of Jesus and by these events that took place with Lazarus, the miracle that took place of him raising Lazarus from the dead because it had a tremendous impact upon the, uh, the, the people of that time. Now, he had been known, of course, as a miracle worker, but it was because he was so close to Jerusalem, the center of power, that this impact uh, uh, affected the priesthood to the point where they began to think about ways that we have to do away with this man because you could see he's going to cause trouble. And the stage was set for the events that would take place very soon after. And it wasn't too soon after that Jesus does, of course, we know, comes to Jerusalem and is welcomed. Uh, and that's on Good Friday is this is what's uh, he's come. He, he comes in to the town of Jerusalem and is honored. And we'll cover that and go into that story next time. So think about this. What is resurrection really? Resurrection is, of course, outwardly is the physical upliftment of bringing Lazarus, in this case, back from the dead. And of course, ultimately, Jesus himself is resurrected. But the deeper resurrection is for each one of us, those of us to the degree that we walk in darkness, we walk in, you could say, death, spiritual death, spiritual darkness. The resurrection of our soul is the resurrection, the upliftment of the soul out of darkness into the light. And this was the deeper message of what Christ was bringing. And this is the message that all great masters they bring is to resurrect those who are in darkness into the light. The light comes, remember, there's Swami used to talk about uh, you could be living in darkness for eons, just as those Egyptologists who would dig up a crypt in the desert of Egypt, and they would open that tomb and darkness had been in that tomb for three or 4,000 years. But in an instant, light entered and everything was in the light. All it took was one instant. And so it is for us. We could be incarnations, perhaps millions of incarnations, living in the darkness, the souls in darkness. But one glimpse of light can awaken us to that. And that's what the great ones, the great masters, the avatars come, the great gurus come to be able to awaken us all to that light. And, to the, and when we have just a glimpse of that light, we see that light everything changes and we see, ah, that light exists. The potential is there. That which we have heard rumors of is real. It's embodied. And of course, we, we, we long for that. And that's what the message of the great masters throughout the ages is to bring that light. And that light is what awakens souls to their own higher self. And that's what, the, what Jesus brought in his time, what master brings in, in his lifetime, that hope that yes, the, the message of the ancients from centuries of, of spiritual tradition, it's true. And they demonstrate through their own life, through the, uh, through the message they bring, and also through the expression of that message through their own individual life. And for those who have ears to hear, let them hear, eyes to see, let them see. They can see under the surface and they're touched because their hearts are ready. And so our job as disciples is, is, is to awaken ourselves to that light, to receive that light, to all who believed in him, made he the sons of God, receiveth 
made the sons of God. So let's get together again next week and we'll, we'll proceed with the story of Christ. He goes to Jerusalem and what happens then? God bless all.